please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. And we will be taking our lesson in a moment from this particular chapter. Read with me Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> beginning in verse 19, a very familiar passage, but perhaps we'll mine it for a little more than we usually do. It says, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We know that uh, the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews was a letter written to Jewish Christians in order to encourage them not to abandon Christ. These people apparently had become Christians but were suffering persecution and loneliness and they were thinking and slowly you know, moving towards a return to the Jewish religion. And of course, this was tempting for them because, well, that's where their culture was. That's where their roots were. That's where, the, that's where their family, that's where their friends were, these Jews who had become Christians. That's where acceptability, that's where comfort resided in the old religion, in the temple, in the ceremonies, in the, in the old ways that they had had before they came to know Christ. And so in this letter, the Hebrew writer shows them that Christianity, despite its difficulty, especially for this group, Christianity is superior to their old religion and to abandon Christianity would cause them to forfeit all the blessings that they had spent a lifetime hoping for. The things that they had hoped for as Jews, they were receiving as Christians. And the argument was, don't, don't go back to the old ways. The, the things that you finally have, you're, you're going to lose them. And so by the time we get to chapter 10 and the passage that I just read, the author summarizes the reasons why Christianity is worth the effort, and then he gives them four habits, four holy habits to cultivate that will help them to remain faithful. First question, of course, is what are the reasons that were given to these people to answer the question, why is Christianity worth the suffering that they were going through at that time. You know, for people who don't care about life after death, um, a relationship with God, uh, some sort of absolution for their mistakes and sins, for those people, well, religion doesn't have a whole lot of value. I mean, it's evident that there are people in this world who are not interested in these kinds of things. And they can, you know, they can still be kind people, they can be creative people, responsible people, but these people have no, they have no use for religion, especially Christianity. They have no use for Christianity. Now I say this because religion is that thing which deals with these issues. I mean, all religions, no matter how primitive, try to explain or try to provide some sort of insight into how man can deal with his own mortality. All religions try to deal with the idea of the nature of God or the burden of one's conscience. You know, things like fear and guilt and shame as well as how to give thanks. All religions have some sort of approach to these, to these issues, not just Christianity. I mean, religions provide moral codes, descriptions of God, worship styles, answers to the big questions of life. It's not just Christianity that does that. All religions try to do that. 
the key idea is that all religions do this, not just Christianity. However, the argument raised by the Hebrew writer and summarized in chapter 10 is that Christianity does these things, but it does these things better than any other religion had ever done or would ever be able to do. Now, remember, for people not interested in spiritual things, well, this chapter means nothing. But for those people who long to have a lasting and joyful relationship with God, why Christianity was better well, that, answering that question meant everything. And so in verses 19, we're going to go back over the passage now and kind of pick it apart. In verse 19, the author explains why the result is better in Christianity. Let's read it again, just part. It says, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, I'm just going to stop there, the result is better in Christianity. If the Christian religion brings its follower into the very presence of God with an attitude of confidence. You know, the word for confidence here refers to the ability to speak freely and openly, that kind of confidence. You know, in that world, 2,000 years ago, if there was a king, a person could not come into the presence of a king without first being called, and then could not speak to the king without being spoken to, and in many instances, under the pain of death. In the Jewish religion, only the priest could enter the holy place, and only the high priest could enter the holy of holies, and only once per year. The entire Jewish religious system was designed to reinforce the idea that a human being could not and should not be in the presence of God. Everything about it reminded you that you are not worthy. You cannot come close to God. The other religions were no better in the sense that their gods were also unapproachable, and most of their religions consisted of rituals that would appease the anger of their gods, not ones that developed intimacy. And so Christianity was better because it promised a situation where the believer could not only be with God, but that believer could be open with God, free with God, communicate with God, without fear and without shame. No other religion, including the Jewish one, could promise this, could offer this to its followers. In Christianity, the writer continues, he says, in Christianity, the method is better. You know, the result is better and the method is better. Let's keep reading verse 19. He says, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, Watch what he says now, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He inaugurated for us through the veil, that is His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now in the Christian religion, God is the one who devises the way for mankind to be with Him. The writer refers to the blood or the flesh of Jesus to describe the idea that God removes the obstacle that prevents man from being with Him. Man cannot come close to God because there's sin in the way. And he summarizes the story of the gospel where God becomes man in Jesus Christ and offers Himself as a sacrifice or a payment for man's sins and then He resurrects to prove that He is God and that His offer of forgiveness and intimacy, watch, are not only legitimate, but they are attainable for each person. Now, in other religions, man was the one who had to do the work in order to earn the privilege of being with God, and consequently experiencing the peace and joy and eternal life. A lot of religions talk about some sort of peace, some sort of paradise, but the way to get there is you get there. You got to do it. There are works to be done. There are pilgrimages that have to be made. There are sacrifices that have to be offered. <clears throat> There's a certain 
conduct required, a perfect conduct. Yes, other religions offered a way to get to, quote, God, but you had, a, you had to earn your way there. Man had to do religious things in order to be with God. The only difference was that each religion had its own to-do list. One religion, this was the things you had to do. Another religion, they had different things, but they had a different to-do list in order to be with God or whoever was there. And there was never any absolute guarantee of success because if man could fail in many things, well, could he not fail in his religion too? But the Christian religion, for the first time, put the responsibility for salvation into God's hands and man's duty was to trust in God's ability to save him. Imagine, what's my job here in the salvation? My job in the salvation process is I need to trust that God has the ability to save me. <laughs> wow, I mean, isn't that a much surer way of being saved? No longer is it I that have the responsibility to make it. God is the one that has the responsibility to make it. My job is to trust Him. And then thirdly, he says, <clears throat> he says that in Christianity, the leadership is better. Verse 21, he says, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Christianity is the only religion with no earthly leader. God is its only leader or head. Other religions have human leaders, human sources, human heads, and as we have seen throughout history, they fight for preeminence, succession rights, power and position. Why do you think there's such a battle among Muslims, between Shiites and between Sunni Muslims? There are battles, they've been fighting each other a lot longer than we've been fighting them. What do you think their beef is about? What do you think their, their fight is over? Why do you think they bomb each other and kill each other and just destroy each other? They don't agree who is the legitimate leader for Muslims. And I'm not talking about a political leader, I'm talking about the spiritual leader. The Shiites have their spiritual leader that they think he's the one that you know, uh, 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 has the authority that's coming from a Muhammad, and then someone else, you know, the Sunnis know they believe it's another person, and that's what the fight is about. In Christianity, God in Christ is the first leader and the only leader to this day and from this day to the end of time. And the reason for this is that Jesus Christ, by virtue of His resurrection, remains the living leader of Christianity throughout history. No other religion has the same leader present and active in every single generation. It's always the same living leader leading us. So why is Christianity better? the Hebrew writer says, because our leader is always alive and always with us from generation to generation. Now when compared to other religions, you have in Christianity a religion that A, promises an eternal intimate relationship with God. If you're wondering why are we doing this, why do we trust, why do we believe, where are we going? We are going to a place, a condition if you wish, a status, a dimension, you know, you it's hard to explain it, but we're going to a place where we will experience intimate knowledge of God. And the interaction of that knowledge between ourselves and God will be the substance of our experience, and since there is no end to God, there will therefore be no end to our experiencing Him. That's where we're going. No other religion gives us that. In Christianity, we have a religion that has provided historical evidence that the obstacle that hindered this in the past has been removed. Why do you think we, we kind of uh, put that cross back there when we you know, re redid the, uh, used to be on the back wall, if I remember correctly, it used to be on the back wall, now it's on the front wall. 
Why? Because we want to always be reminded of the event that has taken place that has changed our lives. The cross of Christ. It's, a, it's an historical event that happened at a certain time that changed all of our lives and has provided the proof that our sins are gone. And in Christianity we have guarantees that an immovable, eternal leadership will be there to guarantee the truth and the life of the church for every generation. Why do you think Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? Do you think it's because we have great elders? We do, but do you think that's the reason? Or we got great preachers? Or no. The gates of hell won't prevail against the church because Jesus Christ is the living Lord of the church in every generation. And Satan will not overcome him. He has been beaten. No other religion met the spiritual needs of people the way Christianity did. And in the 2,000 plus years since its founding, no other new religion, and there have been many of them, have been able to offer similar, let alone better, promises. So for this reason, the author tells the Hebrews to remain faithful and he encourages them to develop four holy habits that will help them to remain faithful despite the obstacles that they face. So I want to share these with you because they are habits that we need to develop as well because it's easy for us to become discouraged in our faith. So very quickly, four holy habits. Habits number one, all in the text by the way, Habit number one, the author says, practice purity. Verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Practice purity. Get into the habit of staying close to God by keeping a pure heart and a clear conscience. The writer refers to the baptism that believers receive which washes away their sins and washes away their guilt and their shame. The idea is that sin is the thing that separates us from God. It's the action that destroys our intimacy and confidence and our freedom with Him. In the previous verse he says we have the confidence to enter in before God, in the presence of God. But the thing that removes us from His presence is our sins. And when we sin, when we don't keep a clear conscience, a pure heart, we begin to back, God doesn't back away from us, we back away from Him. Practice purity. Christians need to realize that sin, no matter what kind, removes them from the presence of God, and the more we sin, the more we get. That's why we feel bad many times. Sometimes people say, you know, you know, come see me and we talk, we have a real conversation, not just about the weather or whatever, but a real spiritual conversation. Say, you know, I'm just, I've been feeling spiritually dry and I, it just, you know, it doesn't have the same oh, for me, you know, I don't know, I don't know what's wrong. And in our conversation, usually the conversation will begin to drift and I begin to ask them about their sins. Is there something maybe you're doing that you ought not to be doing? Is there something you're thinking you ought not to be thinking? Is there some compromise that you're starting to make? You don't have to scratch very deep until you find out that the reason that there's the spirit has been quenched, if you wish, is some sort of personal sinfulness. Not always, there are the things, but many times it's a sinful spirit a spirit of anger or resentment or jealousy or anger or whatever, lust, those things. Those things, the, 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 the evil in them is that they blind us to the vision of God that we have when we keep a clear conscience. And so if we want to receive promises made by our religion, we have to practice being pure, practice saying no to sin on a daily, on a daily basis. Habit number two, he says, practice Perseverance, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So practice purity, practice perseverance. You know, there's a lot of competition in this world for our soul. 
different religions, different philosophies, different causes, different activities. There are also the forces of evil and Satan who continually try to discourage us from believing, discourage us from trusting, discouraging us from obeying. Christians need to cultivate the habit of remaining faithful to Christ and His teachings regardless of the interference, regardless of the temptations. I've mentioned to you before many times the temptation is not necessarily to do something that is you know, horribly evil, you know, the big sins you know, like adultery or murder or somebody go and rob, you know, embezzle your company. Sure, some of us have done bad things like that, but most of the time the temptation is to lose our enthusiasm for Christ. That's the temptation. Sometimes the evil one, the thing that is most despicable, I find many times, is that he manages in some way to take the joy away from us for things that we have in Christ. He, in other words, makes us feel guilty sometimes for no reason. Sometimes he just doesn't allow us to rejoice in all the wonderful things that we have. And instead of rejoicing in confidence in Christ, we go around moping or we go around being depressed. That's not God's work. God's not working in us when we're unhappy. Somewhere along the line, Satan is working in us. Not always, but many times. The world wants us. The world would dearly love for us to be wrong, for our faith to be unanswered. But the Hebrew writer reminds us that we should practice perseverance because he who promised also persevered in the worst kind of adversity and he was rewarded. If he was rewarded, we also will be rewarded. Okay, first two habits. Practice purity, practice perseverance. Number three, practice promoting what is good. Verse 24. Writer says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. You know, it's so easy to be negative, so easy to be discouraged. I know myself the prayer that I've repeated probably more often than any other prayer to God for my own self is, God, please help me not to be so critical. Help me not to be so negative. Help me not to always see you know, the thing that's wrong instead of seeing the thing that's right. Help me to promote what is good and not only point out what's bad. You know, the world is full of naysayers and thieves and evil men and women who love the darkness, who can counter these people and their works. But we are there with our faith to stand up and say, hey, there is good, we have something good. The writer says, you know, stimulating each other. This doesn't mean telling each other what good that we ought to do, because talk alone, you know, I noticed, talk alone can discourage someone. But talk alone is not always enough to encourage someone. Sometimes words alone are enough to take the, the wind out of somebody's sails. A negative comment, you know, it's enough to kill enthusiasm. But if you really want to promote good, sometimes it, it, you need more than just words. You need actions. I mean, what stimulates others is what they see and what they hear in us. People do what we do, not just what we say. Practicing the doing of good guards our own souls from evil and it builds the faith of other people. Anything more encouraging than watching our brothers and sisters serve give, sacrifice, oh, we say to ourselves, man, if they can do it, surely I can do it. And then finally, habit number four. Habit number four in verse 25, the writer says, and practice regular church attendance. Now that's usually the one we go to right away for Hebrews. That's usually our proof text about not skipping church. But I wanted to show you where it fits in in the bigger picture. This passage is not about not skipping church. This passage is about why Christianity is better and why we should hang on to it. And then he mentions these things that we need to do to be able to hang on to our faith. And one of these things is to practice regular church attendance. 
these Jews signaled the beginning of the loss of their faith by sporadic church attendance. In the beginning, they had the habit of gathering with the saints regularly. Now, as their faith weakened, they had changed their habit and had gotten into another habit. And the other habit was they weren't coming regularly. Actually, this is a, a vicious cycle. And here, on a Sunday night, I know I'm preaching to the choir. But the vicious cycle goes like this. Our faith is weakened by sin, or doubt, or worldliness, or trials, or fatigue, or discouragement. It doesn't matter what it is. Our faith is weakened. And so, for many of these reasons, we start coming to church less and less. And then we come to church less and less, and because of that, our faith is weakened some more because we don't hear the word, we don't take the communion, we don't have fellowship, we don't give, we don't serve. And because our faith is weakened, well then we're much more easily subject to temptation, which in turn weakens our faith, which in turn pushes us away from the church. You know, some people ask, is it a sin if I miss church? And my answer to them is, well, it's surely a step towards sin. You're not, you're not working your way towards glory in Christ by missing church. You're actually working your way in the other direction. And so the reason for Bible class and worship and service and midweek services is not to cause inconvenience, it's to guarantee that the world does not totally dominate your thoughts and energies to a point where you lose your faith. Many years ago I wrote an article <coughs> that compared regular church attendance to an icebreaker, and I know many of you have never seen or even heard of an icebreaker here in Oklahoma, but up in Canada we have icebreakers that, go, that plow, you know, they're, they're ships, big ships with the steel reinforced hulls, and they go up and down the St. Lawrence River and in the Great Lakes, and what, they don't get rid of the ice, they just they break up the ice so that the traffic can, 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 you know, can continue in the cold weather. And the reason they do this is if they don't plow up that ice, eventually it'll just coagulate and, and the entire seaway will just be one big, massive, floating ice. No ship can get through. Well, I compared ice breakers to regular church attendants. Regular church attendance is like those icebreakers. It breaks up the worldliness in our lives. It forces the worldliness in our lives to break apart into pieces. So that the worldliness in our lives, because we're in the world all the time, doesn't just come together and create a mass that covers our hearts where we no longer can hear the word and the word is not effective in us. Is Wednesday church, for example, inconvenient? Boy, I'm sure it is, I know it is. I mean, we had four children to raise. You know, what, a, what a task, and many of you know this. You know, wow, come home from work, come home, have supper, rush, hurry up, oh, we got to get to church, it's seven o'clock. Yeah, it's inconvenient, absolutely, and you wonder, man, is this really, what am I getting out of it? You know? What you're getting out of it is you're not allowing the world to get an upper hand on your schedule. That's what you're getting out of it, first and foremost. Church attendance continually plows through our weekly schedule so that the world cannot form a hard cover over our heart and prevent the word of God from getting in and getting out. Remember, the first sign of a weakened faith is a continual excuse not to gather with other Christians to study and fellowship and worship. And so Christianity is the religion that guarantees the eternal rewards that men and women really want. You know, I have, a, I have a, um, on my, our website, BibleTalk.tv, uh, Hal sends me a diagnostic every month, you know, how many hits we got, how many people visited, what's the most requested lesson or tape or whatever, you know, text. And many months, you know, the most requested title is, what do, women, what do Christian women want? Of the thousands of people that come every month to our website, what do Christian women want and what do Christian men want? I have two lessons on those themes. 
Those are always, you know, if we were selling these, you know, we'd, we'd make a lot of money with those because a lot of people download these. What do Christian men and women want? Well here, what do Christians, never mind men or women, what do we want in our spirit? What we want in our spirit is intimacy with God. That's what we want. That's what we crave. We want eternal life. That's what we hope for. We want freedom from sin and from death and the fear of death. That's what we want. If we have those things, it doesn't matter what else we have. In order to access and preserve these blessings, we must not only believe in Jesus, but we must also develop the holy habits that guarantee that we keep the promises given freely to us by God. And I repeat them very quickly, practice saying no to temptation. Practice, because you're going to have to say no every day, so you might as well get into the habit of it. Practice remaining faithful to Christ. Ask yourself, is what I'm doing, will it help me remain faithful to Christ? Practice doing good in our lives and practice regular attendance at church, fellowship with the saints. We don't do these things to gain our salvation. We do these things to make sure that no one takes our salvation away from us. That's why we do it. One more wonderful thing about Christianity is that it's for everybody. It is not reserved for one culture or nation. It is available for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ and is ready to express that faith by repenting of their sins, confessing the name of Christ, and being immersed or being baptized in water. And so if Christianity is what you need, then we encourage you to come forward and become a Christian today. And if you've not developed or neglected the holy habits and need forgiveness and prayer because you've been weak in developing these things, then the elders are here to pray for you on this occasion and we encourage you to make that recommitment at this time.